Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Dang, I forgot to refill my coffee. Oh. Hold on a second. Just yeah. <laughs> Pause. I'll be right back. <laughs> well, hey, happy Wednesday, everybody. It's idiotic day. Look at all the people we got in the chat. Woo. How's it going, Chris? It's going well. It's, um, as I posted in the chat, it's um, a bright day here in eastern Ontario, but still cold <laughs> but it feels like springs around the corner the days are getting longer the sun is getting stronger and i got one more rhyme i ought to make to finish that rhyming triplet but i haven't got one so <laughs> i'm out yeah Tied i know up. spring is here when my allergies start to kick my <laughs> butt and they are in full swing so uh. It's not uh, not fun, but heck, let's. I'll stop my whining and ask you the question of the day, Chris. Who's hanging out with us today? Well, gang. Speaking of fun, as opposed to not fun, the always fun. Mark Lassoff is joining us again, gang. Mark, there may be some folks who haven't met you yet, although you know you are at lots of conferences and all sorts of other places. But uh, for those who haven't met you yet, let's uh, let's give you give them a little sense of who you are, where you're coming from, that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, I, I, if if they haven't met me, I'm sure they're already impressed. Um, <laughs> so, I am a uh, long-term technical in classroom instructor turned uh, learning developer and designer. Um, over the last 15 years, I've kind of made the transition into full-time online instruction. I've taught two and a half million people technical skills online, including uh, coding and digital design, as well as digital mm -hmm. design tools like Photoshop. Uh, I've got a number of brands out there, um, most prominent of which is called Dollar Design School and uh, also Framework Television. And uh, one of the things I'm known for is uh, starting the first uh, free streaming network to teach people digital skills. And uh, I've, I've known Brent probably for about 12 or 13 years. So I'm, I'm glad to be back here with Brent and Chris and uh, on a crisp New England morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're probably in the same weather pattern as, as us too right now. So uh, often gets blanketed all the way across the mm -hmm. eastern seaboard and uh, regions north. So And yeah. such. We've had yeah. the coldest winter on probably, I don't know if it's on record, but boy. In my lifetime, it feels Arizona has been chillier than normal. I, I, so. I think, Brent, probably you're sharing your age. It should be the coldest record on MP3. Ah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, but it, records are coming back. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Delish. <laughs> uh, I seem to have distracted us. <laughs> what are we talking about today? <laughs> oh, my goodness, gang. We are talking digital design tips and tricks for e-learning um, with Mark Lassoff. He said, reading the title of the session from the top of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God the teleprompter is there. <laughs> uh, by the way, gang, um, before the session, it was revealed that all three of us are on crack today that's something we just oh. um, i don't know because it because it's the, 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 yeah it's it's if there's anything that happens it's not our it's fault. not our fault know. right <laughs> it's it's the it's the jewish festival of purim and anything could happen which apparently is celebrated by using crack yeah all apparently. right oh <laughs> yeah. uh, tashar is mentioning it's crowdcast's fault well it is it probably yeah is. <laughs> always, always. That's where we always blame it. But the visual design and digital design tips and tricks. And there's a reason why we have you, Mark, come on and talk about this kind of awesome stuff. One, because you do this stuff all the time. And 
you're part of our industry and you kind of understand the struggles that we all have as instructional designers or e-learning developers or other learning and development professionals. And so we like to help people along a little bit because we know not everybody can match up the proper colors when they're creating their e-learning or pick the right fonts or, uh, you know, otherwise have a pleasant design for their users. So let's fix that. Where do we start? <laughs> I think we start with why is design an important component of what I call generically digital learning? Okay, define that. Right, what what you call it? You call it that, but what what is it? What, what I'll, just, is I'll just write my own questions and answer them. Um, <laughs> so there's a number of considerations when it comes to why digital design is important in the current milieu of digital learning, and I, I think the first is credibility. You know, people aren't comparing learning media to the last online course they took. They're comparing mm -hmm. it to the modern media milieu, which includes things like YouTube, includes video games, includes other interactive media on the web, all of which, to be blunt, surpasses generally the state of online learning when it comes to visual design and interactive. Um, so in order to be credible as something that people would want to learn from, as material that people would want to trust, I think it's important to have strong visual design because it sends a message. The second thing it's kind of related to that is, you know, the online learning is often the first thing that new customers see, if it's customer enablement, the first thing that new employees see, if it's going to be... Um, you know, a, a uh, online on onboarding program. And it sets a tone about whether or not uh, they are important, you know, like say, hey, we got you the most mediocre experience we could <laughs> onboard you um, because I read 20 years ago that visual design wasn't important in learning, really doesn't send quite the message that people want to send. And then there is indications that people learn better from well-designed materials. And you can look at research from, from you know, Mayer's Multimedia to Lou, all of which indicates that visual design is an important component of learning. And, you know, I can prove that with, with one example, because I've had this discussion of whether or not it's important. And, you know, if we look at accessibility in courses, if you use colors that are not contrasting enough, you're mm -hmm. going to injure the learning experience for many people who are consuming your learning. And I think the last thing that I'd say about why it's important, you know, I think sometimes in the day to day as learning designers, instructional designers, whatever people call themselves, we forget the fact that we are stewards of the people who are learning from the materials that we create. And that's a big responsibility because we are enabling someone to do their job, get another job, enhance their career, graduate high school, whatever the case may be for the learning that you create, it's probably or may serve a critical role for the people who are consuming it. And, you know, we need as learning designers to take that responsibility seriously. Part of that is having good visual design. But I've, I've got a good piece of good news because I think one of the things, one of the pieces of uh, feedback that I get is, well, you know, that's great, but I'm not talented. I'm not a graphic designer. And the fact is, there's nothing I'm going to show you today that's based on talent. I'm not talented. Um, but I did learn skills and learn information that allowed me to apply visual design concepts to the work I do. And I think that's really where any, any instructional designer can hone their skills is by learning the theory and learning the skills and the software and tools in order to do this well. But there's no talent involved here. You know, we're not doing, we're not doing art, we're, we're doing design, and, and design is really a set of standards and, and, and theories that are applied to, to the work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, design is important for credibility, as, as you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's the difference between being perceived as, you know, amateurish and, and or professional, and therefore that influences the perception of the information. Um, it's, uh, it's also important for organizing how the, you know, the present visual design ties into the presentation. Um, and I also think um, it, it also plays a role then, you know, in the affective aspect of learning. In other words, it sets a tone or a mood 
um, and and can then and that influences you know the the where the person is you know as they're consuming the content too. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have I, I have no I don't have an education credit to my name. Um, you know, I like many people in here, I'm sure, kind of backed into this industry accidentally, not mm -hmm. as a trained instructional designer, but I was a classroom technical trainer and I was traveling all over the country teaching people coding and design skills. And then I got colon cancer and couldn't travel for the period I was I was being treated. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make the transition to online learning almost as an emergency to keep my insurance. Um, but I fell in love with it. I've been in it ever since. But, you know, my perspective is more of the consumer, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think sometimes we get a little bit caught up in theory and we, we forget obvious things that like, you know, it's just a more pleasant experience if something is well designed. And mm -hmm. why wouldn't we want to have people have a more pleasant experience? Yeah. The other thing that I think is a little different about me is that um, I forgot. I guess I'm the same as everybody. No, <laughs> I, I, now I, remember. I turned 49 a couple of weeks ago and it's been downhill. Um, is, is that, you know, I generally, the learning we create is purchased by individuals and companies. And if you're in that situation, mm -hmm. you know, the design credibility is important because people very much do judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. Craig, Craig said something interesting about, you know, reaching out to the marketing team. Yeah. I actually, my uh, newsletter next week um, will be about stealing from marketing <laughs> and television and, you know, where we can steal from um, in order to, uh, you know, create better learning. I'll put the link in there now in case anybody's interested. A, a lot of it too depends upon um, just looking around you, right? Like when you're, the design is everywhere, as they say, right? And oh, you, sure. I, I think the real trick for us is to, to, to pay closer attention. The best designers I know that, uh, you know, YouTubers that I follow or other influential visual designers, they always talk about seeing inspiration on a daily basis in nature, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, even in how yeah. cities look from certain angles and things like that. And they, they have a particular way of looking at things, but that's a practice that they've developed. And since, you know, we're, it's not really part of any curriculum in the, in an, in the instructional design world. Uh, you know, we don't, we aren't really trained to think that way, but since this has become part of what we do, we, we need to present the content in a way that looks pleasing and we need to understand what that means. Right. And, and, and I think, you know, to your point, Brent, uh, opening our eyes to the design all around us is critical. I think, you know, if anybody's taking a drawing class, it's really a class of how to see, not how to draw. Um, and yeah. that's, you know, a critical skill set. But I mean, you know, I think it's kind of like if you take a class in college film, you'll never see film the same way. You know, all of a sudden, you'll be, well, I don't think the protagonist was well defined. You know, you'll be leaving the theater with this kind of critic's view. But design is much the same thing. Once you understand how design works, you're going to see examples of bad design all over the place. The example I give, I, I went to a conference years and years ago that Brent may or may not have been running at the time. And um, there was a visual design session that was undermined by the quality of design of the title slide, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, I, I left, um, you know, because I think that design is all around us, but it's also something that's on a level that we don't always appreciate it. But mm -hmm. once you become more visually aware, you will. So what have, um, what have you got for us? Sure. What, what so I, I, so let's, let's, let's get into the good stuff, the tips and tricks and all that. So I think, you know, there's a couple of areas where obviously I think that people are um, interested in. Tooling, I think, would be one. We talk about a little bit about colors, about typefaces and fonts, and then images. And I've got a bunch of resources here that what I'll do is I'll post them as I discuss them in the chat, but I'll also post them all at the end. So if everyone sticks around, they can just kind of do one quick copy and, and paste and get everything. I think it'll be Grab the easiest them way. But, and we'll, you know, we'll make sure we include them all in the blog post too, as a follow-up. Great, if folks great. yeah, that's under. perfect. Cool. So if we talk about tools and tooling, I mean, the first thing I, I, I want to say, and, and I'm about to do a session at Learning Solutions um, called Enough with the PowerPoint already, <laughs> is that, you know, PowerPoint was never des designed to be 
a graphic design tool. It was designed to, you know, hold and create and manage presentations. Um, and unfortunately, by appointing PowerPoint to the primary tool, we're losing a lot of power and flexibility in, in what we can do in design. Um, I, you know, I'm going to share my screen real quickly because I've got, I happen to have Photoshop up here. Google. Let's do it. And let's see here, window. There we go. And now I'm going to move stuff all around so I can still see everything. <laughs> all right. Do you guys see uh, Photoshop? No, we're seeing the Crowdcast still. Stop hiding. But we're seeing something, so that's a good start. That's a good place to be. <laughs> Try that again. I apologize. I have two monitors. I don't. Let's see if how this works out. We'll try it one more time. Yeah. There's something. some great chat going on. You, you guys in the <laughs> chat are fantastic. I, I, I love the, I love the white space uh, comment. We don't do that enough. And um, <laughs> bullets, bullets, bullets. Thanks, James. <laughs> so. Uh, I just kind of wanted to show some of the I'm working right now on a WordPress course for uh, one of the a really large hosting provider uh, that's European based. So that'll be you know facing for their members. Um, and I just kind of wanted to show kind of when I'm talking about visual design, some of the things that we're doing now, my work is video based. So we you know, we really try and have visuals that are have a lot of contrast, follow a basic color scheme, have a basic typography hierarchy. And you can see some of that here. And if you notice the typefaces that we're using are all one typeface, but a related family. And, you know, we're trying to use colors and type styles that are similar. So this is kind of exactly how the output looks. Um, so we've got probably 20 or 30 of these screens that we're using throughout the course. So the first thing kind of I want to discuss now that I, I think that maybe wasn't worth the effort to show, but whatever. Um, no, it's a good place to no. start for sure. Yeah. The first thing that I, I, I want to talk about is, is color. And color is primary when it comes to design because everything is a color except for black, which is the lack of any color. So when it comes to choosing colors, people generally want to choose color schemes that work well together. And there's a number of ways to do that. But one of the ways I really like is using the tool Adobe Color at color.adobe.com. That allows us to choose different types of color schemes and colors that work together. So we could start, for example, with a brand color. And I think everyone has a brand color. And then, you know, create colors that are analogous to that using triadic color schemes or complementary color schemes. But it's all based on color theory, meaning we're looking at the basic color wheel and looking at relationships between colors in the color wheel. There's another site to do that as well. That's if you're not part of the Adobe world, that's called, I don't know how to pronounce this, but colors or coolers, maybe. Yeah, that one's always been... A I, I read it differently every time I see it. Yep. I think I think it's meant to combine like cool and colors. Um, no, I think it's because they couldn't afford to buy actual <laughs> colors.co. <laughs> well, I mean, who 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 really can, right? There's also so um you know, there's also material design standards that people may find useful. So this is a site on material design and colors and material design. So I'll paste that one. I'll, uh, so I'm trying to look at I, Go ahead, Brent. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, there's some such great comments in the chat, you guys, and, and such great questions. And especially, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very reflective of the work we do. And, the, and, uh, and a lot of the questions, um, you know, we hear an awful lot. Uh, and I, the place that I always like to start and the thing that I appreciate the most, this connects with marketing is, um, I used to spend a lot of time trying to learn colors and no matter how hard I tried when I would try to pick them out for some reason, my eyes don't see colors exactly the same way as everybody else. Um, my wife will constantly, whenever I try to, um, Photoshop any family photos or anything, she always laughs at me because everybody turns out a little bit green. 
uh, and I, I can't figure out why. So I've kind of given up on it. And what I really appreciate is when the marketing team gives me that design document that they have, right? And they, they give you the little color chips, right? The, the five, you know, primary colors and the subsets of colors, they tell you the fonts, all that kind of stuff. And all I have to do then is put them into, uh, you know, my authoring tool and uh and then all those colors are chosen for me and i don't have to think about it too much i i know they're going to match up if i use them correctly and they're also going to be consistent with the corporate branding and all that kind of stuff so um yeah my tip is get see if you can get your hands on that design doc from your marketing department for the company and it will save you a boatload of headache and frustration yeah and you know what brett that's a great point and if you don't have one you can actually look up the standards for other big brands. Um, actually, at one.walmart.com, um, I'll put this link up here. They actually have a uh, the Walmart brand visual identity guide. Ah. Uh. Um, and you can kind of see how one is professionally done. Because I really recommend that every mm. brand... Um, you know, every company, every project actually start with design guidelines. The first deliverable when I'm working on a video course for somebody is going to be the design guidelines. What colors are we using? What are the typefaces going to look like? How are we placing them? What limitations? What about sizing? You know, things like that are all included in this way. If they engage someone else for maybe print design in the project or need to do stuff internally they have a guide that shows them exactly what they should and shouldn't do even if they're not yeah. you know technically designers like i am um yeah people are making really good points here mm -hmm. um so the, janelle asked about cultural meanings behind colors oh yeah there's and, that too yeah i mean different cultures have different associations with different colors and that may be something you want to research and be, be careful it's 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 a great point yeah um you know and and uh, john is is kind of giving some tips on searching for the brand guidelines for most large companies have them <clears> online <throat> the other place you can look is if uh, you go into a website for a company you can't find anything if they have a link to their press room mm -hmm. frequently the press room will have logo and guidelines so you, you can get that information so, but you know the thing is just to have something documented as part of a project and I, for us it's a first step that really, really helps. Now, by the way, if you're brand new to the idea of color and you want to read a fascinating guide, the one that I recommend is called Interaction of Color by Joseph Albers. It's available on Amazon for like 15 bucks. And it's really a fascinating guide about color, mm -hmm. how colors interact. The other author I would read on on color is Leatrice Eisenman who I had the thrill of my life. I got to talk to her on the phone about four months ago. I've been a big wow. fan of Leatrice for years. She's kind of the queen of color and has worked with Pantone for years. Um, um, very, very cool. And has written, writes about color, teaches courses on color. Um, so really, really good stuff there. But I think, you know, color is one of the things that really, if you do it well, it makes such, I'm listening to my cat make lots of noises because <laughs> she's jealous. Um, if you do it well, it's one of those things that has such high and immediate impact on the quality of your presentation that, yeah. you know, without a whole lot of effort, you can really improve your overall presentation by simply having a color scheme. And also all of the studies show that, you know, consistency is important for learners so having those consistent colors and consistent color scheme is going to not only give you a more complete presentation but also you know better looking presentation mm -hmm. lots of great links being added too by the folks in the chat to a bunch of different other resources etc too uh, jennifer's pointing out in the past year i've had to build three different courses based on red and black <laughs> Good fun times. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, so uh, we, this this brings us over to our theory of constraints, right? Uh, you know, when you <laughs> when you are given some constraints, sometimes it's easier to be creative when you have extreme constraints, and you can actually 
uh, you know, do more interesting things with less. Uh, and, uh, or you can just be really frustrated and it can just be an awful experience, one or the other. Which... Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would rather be constrained into a good color scheme hmm. that, you know, maybe yes. a little boring as, as an instructional designer, but at least we know that it works. It's, it's going to be recognizable yeah. as part of the brand. And, you know, some companies so jealously guard their color scheme that they actually have a copyrighted Pantone ink that's mm. formulated for their particular color. And they have a specific hex, you know, formulation for their color. I'm a, a University of Texas alumni, and I actually did some initial way back in the in the uh, very early days of digital design, did some work for the school. And to make that burnt orange there was only one burnt orange. There's only one red for Coke, you know, and, and these colors, they're extremely je jealously guarding their color mm. scheme as part of their brand. Yeah. Mm. Richard says Coke does it. Yeah. There, there's a number of examples. The red and the blue from American airlines are very specific formulations, but it's also part yes. of what allows a brand to evolve and a design to evolve. You know, the color scheme can stay consistent as the design evolves with the times because the colors can be classic and can be forever but the design can have variations that makes it more current and modern with the same color scheme yeah yeah let's uh let's let's shift the conversation over to fonts if you don't mind a typefaces uh, please or, or typefaces <laughs> yes well, my apologies <laughs> Um, so first of all, I, I wonder, does anybody in, in the, uh, in, in who's attending today know the difference between a, a typeface and a font? Cause technically they're not the same thing, even though even I use the words interchangeably and just about, except for like typographers teaching at the school of visual arts, everyone I know uses the terms interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. A typeface is the design of the glyphs or characters overall and the similarities between them that make the typeface uniform and we all have typefaces that we like right now I, i'm really obsessed with this typeface called champion because hmm. chris doe put it out on linkedin um so i've been obsessed with using that it's got a number of variations bantamweight welterweight and it's really cool i've been using that for just about everything um and by the and way, by the way Chris to... Chris Doe is fantastic. You, you can't just throw out a name like that and not, uh, and not Sorry. tell people to, to, to follow. He, he's great. I do. I follow all of his stuff, too. Chris Doe is definitely one of the leaders in the design world uh, for just for contrast. I am not. <laughs> this is why um, we follow him. <laughs> So Chris, and, Chris, and pay attention want, to what he does. <laughs> if you want someone who really thinks about design and considers and cogitates over this stuff, Chris Doe is great to follow. And you can just search him on LinkedIn. Chris Doe, he publishes great uh, like infographics, um, hmm, really, yeah. really good designer, good stuff. But anyway, so Champion is one I've been, I've been fascinated with. Um, but a font is the individual file, right? It's the, it's the file on your computer is the font. The typeface is the design, so the typeface can transcend certainly that little, the, you know, the single file or set of files. That's that's the difference, anyway. I'm, I'm, I know I'm being kind of ridiculous. All right, so let's talk <laughs> about some font resources. The first one that I really like for digital design is just fonts.google.com. Um, Heather, his name that's is spelled one. Dio, Chris Doe. <laughs> it's not, yeah. Um, so uh, fonts.google.com. Google has thousands of fonts that are free. They're well categorized um, and you can find some interesting, interesting fonts that may work for your project. They, and they're really well categorized. You can now download them for, and install them on your desktop as well as refer to them in a digital project using CSS links. So if you want to expand your web presence beyond kind of the traditional boring, you know, Arial, Helvetica, Times New Roman, Georgia, uh, Google fonts allows you to do that. The uh, thank you, Sarah. Sarah just put up Chris Doe's uh, LinkedIn there. I uh, the always appreciate that. The second typeface one that I really like is called Typewolf. Let me put that up. It's just like I'm saying, typewolf.com. And that's a website that provides kind of recommendations, inspiration for using typography. Um, mm. So if you kind of want to just kind of see type and play with it, I really recommend going to the TypeWolf site. <clears throat> what it is is essentially just loads of examples of typefaces, but it puts them into 
context. So the context really helps you visualize how is a typeface and the fonts that belong to that typeface used in ways that are exciting visually. Uh, Richard, we're, Richard's asking about typeface and accessibility. We will get there. Uh, next one is Typekit. This is a subscription-based font library. If you want to spend a little money and get even more higher quality, Typekit gives font suggestions, etc. It's uh, in addition to the Adobe Cloud, which many of us have. Um, but if you're doing a lot of work inside of Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, the Adobe suite, I'd, I'd highly recommend that. A um, couple more. Type IO is another just kind of real world examples website. All right, while you're dropping those in there, um, uh, I'll just like some basic tips uh, and tricks for using them. I, 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 I love that you dropped in the one uh, website that actually shows how to actually use the type. Cause I think that's where people struggle. People will find a font that they like, or that looks really pretty, or they'll find 20 of them and use all 20 in a presentation. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with the, the one easiest tip to give people is, you know, don't use a boatload of, different types of fonts and right. stuff like that, unless you're building an e-learning course that's explaining all of the differences <laughs> of all of the fonts and all of that kind of stuff, or, or there's some other reason why you absolutely have to, there is, um, and there's a method to how you pair different types of fonts. Yes, ab absolutely. Great point. So when I was uh, in eighth grade, I got my first Mac and that was the first computer I had that gave me access to different typefaces. The Commodore 64 that I had previously had one typeface called Ugly. Um, <laughs> and in the Mac, so I would make documents that had nine different typefaces and fonts in them. And don't do that. So here's the deal with, with, with typefaces. Contrast is king. You want to make sure that you use typefaces that have a good deal of contrast. So one trick is to is to use a single typeface, but different variants. For example, the thinnest version and thickest version of that same typeface, you know they're going to work well together because it's the same typeface, it's the same design, just different variants. But if you're going to use different typefaces entirely, use very different typefaces. For example, use a sans serif for your body text and for your headings, use a serif font or whatever it is, but just make sure there's enough visual contrast there. If you use similar fonts, for example, if you use Arial and Helvetica together, it looks like you made a mistake. It doesn't look like you made a deliberate choice about your typefaces. There's a lot of ways you can create contrast, size, color, white space, all of which creates contrast for your typefaces, but you've got to make sure you're using that contrast effectively. And the other thing I would say is, and this applies to all design, is don't be afraid to use white space with your type. Pixels are free. So give your learners uh, breathing room in your designs. Nobody likes the wall of text. Nobody thinks it's a good idea. So don't do it. You know, and, and, and I think you know, sometimes when it comes to digital presentation, the less type, the better. Use a little bit of high impact type versus using lots of type in a, in a digital presentation. Yeah, another a, a, another tip, and Janelle kind of reminds me of this, is uh, using kerning and letting, uh, the terms from the old school uh, world yeah. of type type setting, right? And and the, the reason why this hits home for me is, and I'll bring up Chris Doe again, that um, it may even have been the champion font I was watching him use. I remember, or, or some particular font that he used, and I remember downloading it, and then I remember using it and i remember thinking to myself my design does not look like his design and then i started realizing oh that's right he's not just it's not just about the font like once you get the font now you have to figure out how to make that font look good and a lot of what makes a font look good is how close the letters are together or how far apart they are and it can totally depend upon the the word that you're typing because some some of just the way the characters are shaped, they look like they're a little bit further apart from another letter and whatnot. And so some words, especially when they're blown up really big, can look like not necessarily spaced just right. And so you use kerning. Thank you, Janelle, again, for reminding me that to 
to to to close the gaps a little bit uh maybe between letters or or to just squish a word or spread a word out uh, you know whatever well, you're looking for and at the extreme i'm going to share my screen again and I, I, after showing this i may never be asked on here again but i'm going to i'm going to do it anyway um and that's that you know in the extreme did we did that work yes um in the extreme you know not kerning your type correctly can actually wrong screen lead again. to user errors. Oh, there it is. Um, so this is a store called Kids Exchange. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, um, you know, better better kerning of the type there would have <laughs> led to a a better better result. Um, <laughs> If you're in Florida, I apologize if we just broke some kind of law. But the you know the point is you know to to a greater extent, um, you know all of these adjustments. The bigger your type, the more you need to think about kerning, which is the space between individual letters, tracking the space between text overall, how loose or tight it is, and then letting, which is the space between lines. All of which needs to be adjusted in order for your type to look good. I spend an awful lot of time. This is another area where a little bit of knowledge, huge payoff because mm. most digital fonts are not kerned correctly for display. Spending that time can make your type look so much better. If you thought the type on the examples I showed in Photoshop before looked good, it's because I actually spent the time to individually kern mm the text and make sure it was as visually appealing as possible. Here's a trick, by the way, if you're in Photoshop or any of the Adobe suites, there's an option to kern optically, which means the, the actual software will kern based on what the human eye would see. And it's giving you a much better result than using the standard kerning that comes with the typeface, which often the typeface you know producer didn't pay any attention to. I had no idea that feature was there. That is a fantastic tip. Well, speak, that's, a, that's a great time for me to, to let people know that uh, by <laughs> virtue of coming today, I'm giving access to my course called Rock Out with Photoshop for at no cost. Um, there is the uh, link to sign up. And uh, if you do sign up, but for Photoshop, Rock Out with Photoshop within a day or two, I will give you access. Um, it's instructionalmedia.co, which is my new URL slash goodies. Ooh, awesome. goodies. <laughs> slash goodies. Do they need a do they need a special code or anything from this particular show to get into it? Or you're just gonna uh, cut it loose? That no, it's I'm I, you know, I, I don't present that URL everywhere. So um uh, no, just okay. as long as they fill out that form at the instructionalmedia.co slash goodies, it's just standard, you know, name, phone number, social security number, credit card number, or names of your children, that kind of thing. Um and your, your Bitcoin you account info. Yep. Yeah, nothing yeah, just, really important. All in the up uh, once you upload a complete credit report, you'll get access to uh, the actual course. <laughs> And Kesselko, uh, I have not seen you in a while. So good to see you. You make me laugh so hard. <laughs> I'm just Q's a been, hunk of hunk of kerning love. <laughs> Q has been dropping the um, dad jokes into the chat all, all the way through. This is like this is third or fourth for this particular session. He's he's on a roll. <laughs> uh, uh, for those of you okay. listening to the audio version of this session here today. Um, you do miss on some of the jokes and, and other things that happen in the chat. So this is why we like live. Uh, this mm -hmm. is great. You guys, you guys are awesome. Do we? Yeah. Do we have a little so, time to talk about uh, images and image resources? Oh yeah, let's do yeah, that real. Got quick. a few more minutes. Yep. Yep. Okay. So um, let's let's stop using bad stock photography. Um, you know, I've seen diverse family eating dinner <laughs> so many times. I feel like I'm eating dinner with them. Oh my gosh. Um, so stock photo photography, when the last time we did our website here at Domino, um, we did sort of a survey of the e-learning landscape websites and there were two separate e-learning tools, of varieties, et cetera, that were using the same basic set of kids with aviator goggles on and kids. Oh yes. Like, it was like, oh, everybody latched onto that particular stock. It was like, 
okay, there's rule number one for the new website design. We won't use that set of collect that set of photos. Well, I mean, that's a real problem. There's only so many like sets of photos mm -hmm. that apply to, for example, that if your target market is coders or programmers and everybody using the same stock photos because it's free on pexels or whatever, <laughs> um, you know, is not helpful. So I just put in uh, five resources for free and low cost stock photos and images. Um, thank you, chat GPT. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these are the, these are all these are all that I know, but um, you you may find these helpful. Just copy that, and and you can get some free stock photos. Here's my first thing: when it comes to stock photos, you do not have to use the photo as it comes to you, right? You do not have to use the photo the way you download it. We always take crop photos, and and my team and I will crop them and change the perspective, change the shape, change the coloring kill the background, you know, take the stock photo as a starting point, not as an end point. Um, the other thing too, there's often complaints that the stock photo families are not diverse enough. So I've also added a number of sources for more diverse stock photos that if you want to make sure that your learning looks more like the population at large, um, mm -hmm. There's a number nice. of, of popular stock photo sites that are available out there. Some of these are free. Some of these are paid, low cost. Um, but I've used a number of these, like Create Her, um, just to give kind of a more diverse and representative view of the people who are out there in the world. Because design should be representative and relatable to the people right. who are consuming it. So if we mm -hmm. take a, you know, as as we could in, in, in this particular webinar, just a, you know, white, European male perspective on things, you know, we're not going to address uh, the entire, you know, population of people learning and we're going to make people feel excluded. So I think it's important to be representative in, you know, the content that you're producing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think for sure. I think those are great resources. As, Thanks for those. As far as images, you mentioned color and changing them, changing those images, it, because a lot of times when you download different photos different stock photos from different websites that they'll come like the like the photographer shot it with a different lens and you know they post it and there's different lighting and so everything is is can oftentimes be just not look the same and by just adding like a simple filter across all of the images that you're going to use even though those images are very, very different and used for different reasons or whatever, they're now going to have sort of a, uh, a consistency in, in, the, in, the, in the visual representation and how they match everything else. And it doesn't take much to go in and figure out how you want to do that. Um, sometimes it's as easy as just clicking a filter in a, in a very simple editing tool that might be in your authoring platform mm -hmm. or um, you know, or if you know how to use Photoshop or any other tool, just drop all the photos in and, uh, you know, use the same color gradient filter or whatever to make those adjustments. And, and then everything, then they'll all look the same. People may not realize this in Photoshop. If you're a Photoshop user, uh, the camera raw filter now in the current version of Photoshop can be applied to any image. So if you go to filter and use the camera raw filter, you have every adjustment for both color correction and creative impl creative use of color within an image. So you can really do some interesting thing to composite your images using that camera raw filter. If you use Lightroom, it's the same things you have in the in the raw filter for Lightroom but you don't even have to be in the color, the raw color format. That'll let you adjust everything. You can do some really, really interesting things. Um, we use it a lot for our thumbnails for YouTube and for articles and things like that. Yeah. Um, we think, you know, that both of those are, you know, excuse me, that, uh, that the camera raw filter is pretty much the bee's knees when it comes to color. There's so much more we could probably talk about, but sadly we've reached that moment in time mark before we depart here drop your contact info and, and, uh, and goodies url back in the end of the chat there and folks if you're listening to the audio version of it, you can find it uh, um mark thanks so much for joining us here today as always um it's been a blast and it's been also Indeed. very helpful too not just fun but fun for the whole family and good for us too you know 
I feel like a cereal commercial here or something. No. This was gang <laughs> great. Had a good t- had a good time once again. Awesome. Uh, good luck at Learning Solutions. If you ha- if anybody's going there, make sure you check out Mark's session. Folks, of course, we do have to mention that uh, Idiotic Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino Learning Systems. Um, and maybe there are some things that uh, that our, our uh, e-learning software suite, Domino One, can help you with. So there's a link in there to, to check out that and learn a bit more. Or if you're listening to the audio version, it's domino.com, D-O-M-I-N-K-N-O-W.com. Indeed. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Mark. So much fun. You guys in the chat always make this so much more fun. Thanks for being here, everybody. And uh, There's so much more design stuff to talk about. We will do it again next time.